Well, I just want to, um, I want to thank Elizabeth Butler for inviting me to participate this morning. Um, it's been fascinating. I was a student of uh, urban history at James Madison College at Michigan State University, and this has just been great. I'm um, a former, I am a graduate of U of D Law School before it was known as UDM and an adjunct professor here. And um, I'm just really proud to be part of this morning. And I'm proud to introduce our next panel. Um, we'll start with the center. In the center is Judge Gerald Rosen. Judge Rosen was appointed. My usual position, in, in the middle. In, in the middle. Uh, he was appointed to the bench for the Eastern District of Michigan in 1989. Um, you have everyone's biography, short biography, attached, so I'm not going to read through all of that, but um, give you a little color behind each of our panelists. Um, Judge Rosen has very strong roots in Detroit, and as many of you may know, um, was the chief mediator in the Chapter 9 bankruptcy, having been appointed by Judge Rhodes for that position. And in his role as chief mediator, um, he was the architect of what's become known as the Grand Bargain, and Judge Rosen advised me that he is in fact writing a book about that. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that Judge Rosen made himself available to the parties in the case uh, virtually wherever he was and at any time of the day or night. And, um, and, and what was accomplished through the Chapter 9 was due in very large part to his efforts. Um, sitting to my immediate left is Eugene Gargaro, and Mr. Gargaro um, is a prominent uh, philanthropist, uh, participant in Detroit Cultural Matters, and I just realized, oh, here, I've got it. Um, and again, his biography is um, in the materials. And what I'd like to tell you that is not in the materials is that Mr. Gargaro is the recipient of many awards, honors, and accolades, including in 2013, he was awarded Crane's Detroit Lifetime Achievement Award for the third annual General and In-House Counsel Awards, quoting from Crane's, based on a career of legal, corporate, and community impact. In 2015, Mr. Gargaro and his wife were honored as the recipient recipients of the DIA's Lifetime Service Award. Prior to the Grand Bargain, Mr. Gar Mr. Gargaro was a driving force behind the Tri-County DIA Village, which had a huge impact on the DIA. And more importantly, I think it had a huge impact on the Tri-County community um, because people who otherwise felt they didn't have access have now had unlimited access to the treasures that we have there. And in honor of Mr. Gargaro's um, tireless work, a street is being named for Mr. Gargaro near the DIA. Um, to my far left is Professor Brian Fry, who comes to us from University of Kentucky College of Law. And again, you have his information. I think what's of particular interest is that Professor Fry holds an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, he went to UC Berkeley for his undergrad and um, NYU Law School. Um, in addition to clerking for a Ninth Circuit judge, um, Mr. Fry's research focuses on the legal issues affecting art organizations and artists. Mr. Fry, I'm sorry, Professor Fry, forgive me. Professor Fry's um, medium is film, and he has had films shown in curated shows, in particular at the Whitney Biennial in 2002, and America's Hard to See um, in 2015. Um, Professor Fry also uh, created, would be created, a film called Our Nixon, which is based on home movies of uh, President Nixon's cronies, um, and has been shown on CNN and also shown worldwide. So I welcome the panel and we will get started.
Judge Rosen. Okay. I'm going to stand here. We're going to do this maybe a little differently uh, than some of the programs. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you, Julie uh, and Dean Cracker. Thank you very much. It's good to be back at U of D. Uh, I actually used to teach her just down the hall back in the dark ages of the early 90s. I taught for about four years here, uh, taught evidence, um, and uh, I very much enjoyed my association with this school. Um, so we're going to do this a little differently. Uh, I am, as Julie said, writing a book, and uh, I have an introduction to the book that I'll read. It's about six and a half minutes, because it tells us where we were and what those of us who were involved in the bankruptcy found on July 18, 2013, at exactly 4.06 p.m., when the bankruptcy petition was filed. And then it talks a little bit about where we ended up. And maybe then, after that, Gene and I and the professor here can talk a little bit about what happened in between. So we're going to kind of, my introduction hopefully will kind of bookend it. Uh, the introduction is called Detroit's Big Bang Theory for reasons I hope will be obvious by the end of the introduction. Detroit's decades-long slide toward oblivion crash-landed in our bankruptcy court on July 18, 2013, precisely at 4.06 p.m., spewing in its wreckage its retirees, employees, bondholders, vendors, and creditors of every type, more than 150,000 in all. But behind the daunting debt total in the cold print of the petition of the largest municipal bankruptcy in history, was the story of a city in financial and human extremis. In the bland parlance of municipal bankruptcy experts, Detroit was service delivery insolvent, an antiseptic term, which means that for the city's residents, businesses, employees, and visitors, the city really wasn't a city at all. Basic public safety services, such as police, and firefighting, and emergency medical services, varied between sporadic and non-existent. 40% of the city's almost 90,000 streetlights were out, and cop the copper wire innards necessary to repair them had fallen victim to the scavengers, uh, all leaving the city's residents and businesses vulnerable to the criminals who thrived in the darkened streets. In large areas of the sprawling 140 square mile city, the size of Boston, San Francisco, and Manhattan combined, garbage collection and snow removal were haphazard and unreliable affairs. The city's once vibrant neighborhoods had steadily dwindled in population over the decades from a high of almost 2 million people to fewer than 700,000, and these neighborhoods held almost 150,000 blighted homes and vacant lots, many now hosting crack houses, prostitutes, and squatters. The city's ancient water and sewer system, which served 4.5 million people in the city and its surrounding suburbs, was springing floods and collapsing with regularity and its $6 billion bond debt gave little hope for infrastructure refinancing and rebuilding. The city's debt structure itself was a monument to decades of fiscal mismanagement and dysfunctional and at times corrupt governance that struggled to confront the realities of the city's declining population and revenues and opted instead for band-aids, kicking the can down the road to future city leaders and citizens. But beneath the staggering $18 billion in total debt, were the human costs of its subparts. The city had stopped making its pension contributions for its retirees who had given their working lives to the city, and the pension funds themselves were already an estimated $3.5 billion underfunded. The city owed almost $6 billion in retiree health care to its 23,000 current retirees, and all of this required that 42% of all of the city's revenues be committed to pay these legacy costs, with that number projected to rise over the next five years to 67%. On the day of the bankruptcy filing, the city had less than eight weeks of operating cash, resulting in the imminent prospect of payless paydays for its employees, and there was virtually no hope of generating more revenue because the city had long been at the absolute legal limit of its borrowing authority. Actually, it had circumvented that limit eight years earlier through a quite dubious and possibly illegal, albeit creative, artifice of a financing deal that pledged the city's most reliable source of revenues as collateral. 
But even if the city had been able to borrow or to access the municipal finance markets, this was almost an impossibility. Detroit's bond rating was at junk, junk status and falling, and it had virtually no assets to offer as collateral, other than the iconic, world-renowned art collection of Van Gogh's, Bruegel's, Renoir's, Rembrandt's, Cezanne's, Gauguin's, and the gigantic Diego Rivera murals housed in the city-owned Detroit Institute of Arts, itself a proud but financially fragile institution, which most of the city's creditors now wanted to monetize for their benefit. Beyond this, businesses and entrepreneurs were understandably leery of investing in Detroit. As Detroit filed for bankruptcy, former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick and 40 of his associates had recently been convicted of engaging in a massive shakedown scheme, well known to strong arm those who sought to do business with and in the city, and our grand jury was still at work. And few people seemed ready or willing to step forward to take a chance on taking the difficult and step, risky steps necessary to reverse Detroit's decline. No small wonder that with the filing of the bankruptcy petition, the media and observers around the nation, indeed around the world, were writing Detroit's obituary. Phrases like ruin porn and urban wasteland, complete with full color photographs, were routinely used to describe Detroit. It seemed that much of the world had written this historic city, once the auto capital of the world, its arsenal of democracy, and the home of the Motown sound, off for debt. Less than 16 months later, the presiding bankruptcy judge confirmed a plan of adjustment which shed $7.3 billion in debt and restructured another $3.1 billion, provided $1.7 billion for blight removal reinstatement of public safety services, and revitalization of the city's infrastructure, including its streetlights. Provided for only very small cuts to the pensions of its retirees and transitioned them to a new and more affordable health care plan. Provided for savings to the city's water and sewer system, which itself would now transition to a much needed regional system of $113 million for infrastructure repair and an income stream of $50 million a year for 40 years. Provided the city a stable workforce through collective bargaining agreements with almost all of its unions, set something which had not occurred in anyone's recent memory. Provided for real estate deals that will dramatically improve the city's tunnel to Windsor, its riverfront development and convention center, and the city's bond rating was headed toward investment grade. The plan also saved the DIA and its treasured art collection from liquidation and preserved them in perpetuity for future generations and posterity. At the core of the plan was what had become known as the Grand Bargain, a sort of triple bank shot which monetized the DIA's art collection by raising $820 million from 13 philanthropic foundations, the state and private donors, locked them off in, from creditors in perpetuity and gave all of the arts proceeds to the city's civilian and uniformed retirees to dramatically reduce their pension losses. In confirming the plan of adjustment, the bankruptcy judge called all of this miraculous. This book is not so much a story about the tic-tac of the bankruptcy case itself as it is about the collective heart of the people who made it all possible in less than 16 months, warp speed in the municipal bankruptcy world. It's often said that a successful book must have heroes and villains. There are many heroes and heroines in this story, one of them is right here. But there are no villains. Although there was certainly intense conflict, tension, deep antagonisms and misjudgments, this is instead the story of the dozens of enormously bright, talented, and creative and courageous and incredibly dedicated men and women, the political and community leaders, Lawyers, judges, retirees, financial experts, union leaders and members, private business leaders, financial creditors of all stripes, and visionary philanthropic and community leaders like Gene Gargaro, who step forward together, many at great personal risk or sacrifice, to overcome doubt, distrust, rigidity, self-interest, and the ghosts of the city's past failures, to piece together an almost universally agreed upon plan to rescue and to give rebirth to an iconic American original. 
In short, this is the story of Detroit's own Big Bang Theory, of unrelated people and events colliding together by chance in the same time and space to create a universe of new hope and opportunity for a great city and its people. By a quirk of fate, I was privileged to be <coughs> with this extraordinary group of people at the center of the vortex of, the big, of this Big Bang. This is the story of those people and the events that consumed them. So maybe we can have a discussion about how we got from uh, July 18th, 2013 at 4.06 p.m. to November 7th, 2014, and the confirmation of the plan of adjustment. And uh, one of the leaders, uh, I think of the grand bargain as having three legs, uh, the philanthropic community, the foundations, the state, led by the governor and the legislative leaders, and the DIA. And this man, uh, we, none of us would be here today but for this man, whose vision and um, his willingness to take a leap under the most trying of circumstances and the courage that he showed uh, with his leadership was just incredible. From our very first meeting uh, in which we had uh, what I would call a full frank and candid discussion about the DIA and its art collection, to uh, his meeting with the governor, uh, in which he agreed to join the grand bargain, Gene Gargaro's leadership was a model for people to follow. So Gene, why don't you give your view on what happened? And, Great, and, uh, thank and you, and Professor. Thank you talk about the film he's gonna make about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you very much, Judge. To, to be introduced like that by Judge Rosen is uh, the highest of compliments. Uh, I don't have time to express our gratitude to him for all he's done, but uh, I'd like to second what the judge said. Uh, Dean Crocker, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm a uh, 1967 graduate of this law school, so the comments of the panelists immediately before our presentation were of particular interest. That was an amazing time in our city's history. I remember studying for the bar exam in July of 1967, all during the lead up to that uh, unbelievable and memorable period. Uh, Jerry Cavanaugh was our then mayor, if you recall, a graduate of this law school and as president of the student bar at the time, I remember how proud I was to be able to bring Jerry here. I think he was elected uh, the youngest mayor in the city's history. So a lot of, a lot of wonderful memories, uh, one of which I never met, forget to mention to Dean Crocker. My grandfather was dean of the law school in uh, 1920, and uh, his portrait hangs in the atrium on the first level, and every time I walk in, I, I look up and remember uh, he was the longest sitting member of the recorder's court. One of our panelists mentioned that. So on a given morning after class, I would go over to recorder's court and sit in Judge Scallon's courtroom. I might have been taking criminal law at the time, for all I remember. And I saw a whole different version of my beloved grandfather in that setting than when we'd gather for family gatherings. They had something called early sessions in those days. They'd bring in the troops from the night before that uh, ended up in jail, and my grandfather would sit there for a couple of hours and meet out summary justice, and then we'd have lunch together. And I'd, uh, as I say, I'd enjoy um, Wonderful memories. Uh, Judge Rosen, you don't know this, but we're really uh, gaining stature. Um, Elizabeth Butler, the uh, managing editor of the Law Review, told me before we spoke that we're going to be the featured story and uh, a featured article in the Law Journal. So uh, we've really arrived. <laughs> um, I have so many memories and anecdotes, and I, I heard the judge uh, uh, get a little emotional toward the end of that presentation. Uh, 
This whole story, people come up to me and talk about it as though it's ancient history. And the fact is, as the judge just pointed out, a uh, short time ago, we were just coming out of the bankruptcy, and I think many of us are still living in that time frame and thinking about how uh, remarkable it was to be uh, a member of what I call the all-star team of leadership, uh, starting with the judiciary, uh, certainly the governor, uh, Kevin Orr, there isn't enough time to talk about all the wonderful people that uh, participated in the resolution of this historic moment in, uh, in our history. Being mindful of our time, I'm going to mention a couple of things that uh, I will always remember. This is my 14th year chairing the uh, board of directors of the Detroit Institute of Arts. I could tell you, beware of these volunteer assignments. <laughs> But it's been a remarkable run. Uh, you've heard mention of the Tri-County Village, which we passed in, in August of 2012. Uh, that was quite a feat, given that the taxpayers in the three counties came together to keep the museum open, because we had lost our state funding, and uh, literally there were uh, very, very little op other options to avail ourselves of. Before we got to celebrate, though, uh, then Mayor Bing would call me and say, Gene, we're running out of cash in the city. Now, why would that be important to an art museum? Well, uh, if you think uh, back, the museum was founded in 1885. Uh, a group of Detroiters began the Collecting, collecting of art, hired an art director, and the, the then Detroit Museum of Art was underway. By the 1920s, it had become so successful that the financial carry uh, to continue to build the museum was such, the city uh, families and founders of the museum went to a then vibrant city of Detroit, said, this is a natural, you ought to own this institution and conveyed ownership to, to the city. And in the 1930s and 40s, some of the greatest art in the world was collected and brought to Detroit. Little did we know that uh, some number of years later, that ownership would be uh, uh, put, the, put the museum in great jeopardy. And as the judge just uh, noted, it became the uh, asset of choice once the city was in bankruptcy. And the governor appoints Kevin Orr in January of 2013, and in March or April of that year, I had my first chance to meet the emergency manager team, uh, all very, very skilled restructuring specialists, uh, remarkable group in themselves. And the first meeting, I'll never forget, they said, we've got some really good news and we've got some unfortunate news. Uh, your museum, uh, heralded around the country as one of the great art museums, uh, has been identified by the creditors as Detroit's only asset. But we're here to tell you that we're going to help you protect that asset. This is April. Two months later, in June, we had a similar meeting the very first thing they said was, we really need to monetize the DIA. Our choices were to participate in a, uh, a controlled sale of art, whatever that meant, to loan art to museums around the world for an income stream that could come back to the city, or to pledge the art as collateral. All three of those were not good options, uh, given the uh, likelihood that uh, the art would be the subject of litigation and hope for liquidation. We moved into the summer of 2013, uh, the fall. Uh, I have a chance to talk to the foundation community, and unknowns to me, as a lead up to discussions, certainly with the Ford Foundation, Judge Rosen puts together this 
aggregation of national and local foundations in November of 2013, leading up to, uh, as he noted, what became the grand bargain. Uh, I will never forget the phone call I received from Judge Rosen's uh, clerk saying the judge would like to meet me. Could I come over and uh, uh, just catch up on what, what uh, the judge and others were doing? We had lunch in the judge's chambers, which in itself is a memorable experience. At that, at that luncheon, Eugene Dreiker, a lawyer, a Detroit lawyer known to many of you, was assisting uh, Judge Rosen and his team. But in a couple of hour session, the judge tried out on me a framework uh, that eventually became the grand bargain, as he's just described it. Uh, from there, as you know, the foundation community came in. The governor, with his leadership team in Lansing, uh, people forget what a monumental task that was to match the foundation funding. That took place all throughout the first half of 2014, and then the DIA committed to raise $100 million, which was our task in that same time frame. Tell them how it happened, Gene. It's one of the great stories of the Grand Bargain. Well, uh, when you're raising $100 million, uh, the judge was kind enough to remind me we had 20 years to do it, because that's the payout period. And I think I recall saying at my age, uh, that was a longer time frame than uh, any of us would want. I, I could never hand the... Uh, the chairmanship of the DIA over to someone and say, oh, by the way, you've got 80 million yet to raise. We, we raised 100 million in 10 months, but it was through an amazing uh, uh, response from, foundations were already at the table, mind you, so we couldn't go there. We went to the corporate community, uh, starting with GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And as you know, they're fierce competitors but as I spoke to each of those companies and told them what we were doing, that this was not just about the museum, this was a civic message. Help Detroit exit from bankruptcy, certainly to help Detroit's pensioners not suffer any more than they had to, and in addition to, say, one of the world's great art museums, uh, most of the uh, responses were, how long do we have to pay? And those of you in the fundraising business know when somebody asks you that question, you've already made your sale, and it's just a matter of how you, how you close it. GM, Ford, and Chrysler joined together and committed $26 million as really the opening pledge for the grand bargain. Other museums around the country voluntarily called said that uh, we want to be part participating in the success story that you're building. Um, it was just a remarkable confluence of people, uh, corporations, our entire state of Michigan certainly got behind this. And I'll, I'll close with just an anecdote and then we can, we can uh, talk about things of interest to you uh, in January of 2015, the judge called me and he said, uh, you know, Gene, I've got some things here that I'm going to be putting in uh, the archives at the court, but they all pertain to what we've been doing over the last 18 months. You ought to come over and look at some of these things. And he said, in particular, there's one item I want to show you. In his courtroom on a conference table, he had laid out uh, his own... Uh, in his own hand, the framework of the Grand Bargain as it was being crafted, mind you, a year earlier. And on the back of a legal pad, uh, you, you could see all of the facets, the pensioners, the state, the DIA. There were legal sheets with uh, contributions from foundations. And in a quick moment, I said, Your Honor, this should be hanging in the DIA. This is history not thinking that, you know, he would respond to that. Well, in two seconds, he said, you know, that's a great idea. So now when you come to the museum, and I hope you all do, the 
we have an original Rosen member of the BIA. I thank you all the time. And I would like to you free parking on your girl Boulevard any time you come. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely to be in, in Detroit. I'm really looking forward to spending the, uh, the weekend here. So, uh, candidly, I, I am not a bankruptcy expert. So I was a little bit surprised uh, and pleased and also a little terrified when the Law Journal accepted my proposal to come here and talk to you about this subject. And immediately went to my colleague, Chris Frost, at the, at the University of Kentucky College of Law, who is a bankruptcy expert, and confessed my, my concern. And he reassured me that um, I wasn't in as bad shape as I thought, because there's actually very little law relating to Chapter 9 bankruptcies. And um, on investigation, I was pleased to learn that he was, in fact, correct. And there was very little law relating to Chapter 9 bankruptcies. So I immediately began investigating the, the, the Detroit bankruptcy and the Grand Barton. And um, while I'll confess that I personally am very, very pleased by the outcome, and my wife and I intend to visit the DIA tomorrow, um, I did have some concerns, or I was puzzled by certain aspects of the uh, ultimate decision issued by Judge Rhodes. Um, and then when I learned who my distinguished panelists were going to be, um, I was even more concerned than I had been before, realizing that I was not only not a bankruptcy expert, but also the most outsider of outsiders on this panel. Um, so I'm hoping that perhaps uh, the judge and, and Mr. Gargaro can um, fill in some of the lacunae in what I understand about the circumstances surrounding, surrounding the bankruptcy. Um, so j just for those of you out there who may also not be experts in Chapter 9 bankruptcy, although being Detroiters, I imagine most of you are at this point, um, as Clayton Gillette and other notable bankruptcy scholars have observed, it's kind of a sui generis form of bankruptcy proceeding, um, sort of like a business bankruptcy in the sense that the purposes of the organization, but also kind of like a personal bankruptcy in the sense that it's not possible to dissolve the entity, right? The idea is to reconstitute the city. And in addition, the authority of the judge is considerably more limited than in other bankruptcy contexts. Broadly speaking, um, the judge answers, or rather decides, two questions. First, whether the municipality can file in the first place. And essentially, a municipality can only file if it is, in fact, found to be insolvent. In other words, incapable of meeting its, uh, its debts as they come in. And then the judge doesn't really have authority to make final decisions about broadly speaking, most other things, until the very end of the action, when the judge decides whether or not the uh, bankruptcy, bankruptcy plan should be confirmed. And that that decision is intended to be based on the fairness, and, uh, uh, the fairness of the plan and whether or not it's in the best interest of the creditors, both standards that um, are not as highly developed as, as they might be. Um, notably, um, the court essentially cannot force the city to do anything, although it can force the creditors to give up some of their debts. This, the court can only refuse to allow the filing in the first place, in other words, find the city not insolvent, or refuse to confirm the plan at the end of the proceedings. So um, what happened in the case of the deal set, the settlement? Broadly speaking, the city sold the, the, collect, the DIA collection to the DIA Corporation for $850 million over uh, for over 20 years, or um, roughly 400 million plus dollars in, in cash uh, today for so time value money. Um, some provided by DIA, some provided by foundations, some provided by the city coming from all different sources. Um, so the question for the bankruptcy court then was, was the DIA settlement fair and in the best interest of the creditors? And I'll kind of look at both of those questions and independently. So first, the opinion of the court said that the uh, settlement was fair because the city cannot sell the DIA, the DIA collection. Um, however, the court didn't explain precisely why it thought the, DIA, uh, the city couldn't sell the DIA collection. Um, there's really three reasons given, three broad reasons 
given by the parties to the case, both the, both the city, in a sense, the, uh, the attorney general filed a brief, um, the DIA itself, and the creditor group that also filed objections. Um, the first was that the statute that created the DIA, as well as the statutory authority that enabled the DIA to be sold, essentially, to the city of Detroit and for the city of Detroit to buy the DIA in the teens, uh, prevented the sale of the art. And for a number of reasons, I, I don't think that that, um, that, 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 uh, st that either of those statutes credibly prevented the city from selling the DIA collection. For one thing, uh, the relevant statutes were repealed. And for another thing, they provided an element of the corporate purpose. I, I don't really see how they actually created a charitable trust that prevented a sale at all. Um, the second argument was that many of the works in the DIA collection were burdened by gifts restrictions of one kind or another imposed by the people who donated or bequeathed the work to the DIA collection. Um, and I also don't, find the fine, on the facts, on the merits, find that objection particularly compelling. Either given that, at least as far as I can tell, it seems that very few, if any, of the works were actually so Burden the city typically refused to accept gifts that came with conditions, and also many of the works were bought outright by the city itself. And in any case, um, it's not clear that those uh, restrictions would survive any differently than any other kind of claim in a bankruptcy context. Um, lastly, is the idea of the public trust in art, and that's the idea, the kind of the general idea that art museums and other museums hold their collections, in particular art museums, hold their collections in the public trust, and that public pr pr uh, that public trust prevents them from selling artwork from the collections, kind of, right? So what it actually says is that museums can sell artwork. However, they can sell artwork only to buy more artwork. They're not allowed to sell it for any other purpose. It primarily comes up in the context where a museum is considering selling an artwork in order to cover operation costs, um, but it you know, could conceivably come up in other circumstances as well. Um, so I think calling this a public trust is actually a misnomer, right? It's not a trust at all. The artwork can be sold, it's just, professionally speaking, it's only allowed to be sold for a limited number of purposes. I don't see that as a legal restriction so much as a restriction imposed by the professional societies that govern museums and museum directors. So, on the merits, it seems to me that the bankruptcy court's finding that the city couldn't sell the DIA collection it, it seems to be wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned that it's just not true that the DIA couldn't sell. The, uh, bankrupt, the, the DIA collection. And moreover, under the DIA settlement, in fact, the city did sell the DIA collection and sold it to the DIA corporation. So it's unclear to me how to square the legal realities and the factual realities with the bankruptcy court's findings in, in that part of the opinion. However, thankfully, I think the court's, at least in my opinion, the court's uh, decision fares much better when it comes to the second half, and I think ultimately more important part of its conclusion, namely whether or not the settlement is in the best interests of the creditors. And interestingly, in that section of the opinion, the court seems to imply, almost say, that, it, it, the, this, that, the, um, that the settlement is in the best interest of the creditors, effectively because the city won't sell the DIA collection. And remember, of course, that the court cannot force the city to sell the DIA collection, even if it can do so, right? The court doesn't have that power. So essentially, the, um, the court, I think, is implying there, or suggesting in some way, that um, the, this, the settlement is in the best interest of the creditors because, or was in the best interest of the, of the creditors, because the creditors, A, can't force a sale, B, the city will not sell the DIA collection in the way that the creditors want to sell it, and C, in a kind of a more abstract or inchoate way, that the presence of the art and the presence of the DIA and the presence of the DIA collection in the city is essential for the recovery of Detroit in, in some sense. Um, I'm not sure I would frame it quite that way, but I, I think I, understand, I have a pretty good sense of where the judge was going with that. Um, so it's kind of a complicated analysis. Essentially, will the creditors get any more with or without the settlement? If the city refuses to sell, the bankruptcy court can't force the sale. Its only option is to reject the plan. So it's hard to say whether the plan is better or worse than no plan for creditors. Uh, and, and essentially, I think the, the idea here then is that the plan, is, or rather the settlement, 
in relation to the plan is the best deal the creditors were going to be able to get in practice. So they better suck it up and deal with it because they're not going to get anything more than that and they're not entitled to. Um, so what about the art, though? You know, how, how should we think about this going forward in other contexts? So I'd like to just propose a hypothetical. Right? What if we imagine right, that rather than owning a roughly $4 billion, I'll just use that figure for the purpose of, of argument, valued uh, art collection, the city was sitting on $4 billion in gold bullion, right? Just in the basement of City Hall, $4 billion in gold bullion. Would the city still be insolvent as it approached uh, the bankruptcy court? Hard to say, the debts were really high, it might very well be, right? Even with $4 billion in gold bullion, a commodity, right, in the basement of, of City Hall. Would the deal, would a deal that provided a either none of the value of that gold bullion or only a fraction of the value of that gold bullion to the creditors be in the best interest of the creditors? Well, again, it's hard to say. The first two factors, right, the city can't, the bankruptcy court can't force a sale of any uh, property of the city. And, you know, the creditors may be better off with no deal, with any deal rather than, than no deal, right? But we still got this third factor, right? And of course, Art and gold bullion aren't the same thing, right? Art has a different kind of value and represents something different in the context of a city, um, and, and I think implicates some of the sovereignty issues that are reflected in the peculiarities of uh, Chapter Nine bankruptcy in the first place, right? So why then did the DIA, did the DIA settlement work in context? Well, I think in a lot of ways the outcome, it seems to me, was specific to Detroit the DIA, and frankly, the, the parties involved who were able to work out this, this arrangement. Um, but how should that cause us to think about the kind of the broader questions implicated by the settlement in relationship to the ownership of an art collection in the first place, especially in the context of museums that are already privately held, as opposed to ones that have collections that are owned by the municipality itself? And I, what I'd like to suggest is that we shouldn't take the DIA settlement, even though we think it was a good outcome and, and the right outcome, as an endorsement of the public trust, trust doctrine as expressed by the uh, museum parties to the case um, for a number of reasons, or really two primary reasons. For one, I think there are practical reasons to reject the public trust, trust doctrine. The idea that museums are not allowed or, or not permitted or that they somehow have some inchoate, frankly non-existent, charitable trust preventing them from selling our work for uh, the purpose of operational costs, and that they can sell our work only for the purpose of buying other artwork. For one thing, that doesn't make any sense, right? If the artwork is held in trust, it's held in trust. If you can sell it and use the proceeds for something else, it's not held in trust. So it just, it just doesn't work on the merits. In addition, it, it can put museums in a financial bind Right, museums are often run on a relatively shoestring budget in relation to the size of their collections and the facilities in which they operate. Right, and if a museum, it, it can and has happened that museums find themselves in a circumstance where they're sitting on millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars worth of artwork, but can't meet their operating expenses. And as a consequence, the museum itself will fold and have to give its artwork to some other institution. And I would submit that if we weigh the merits of the two options there, much better that a museum should sell one work of art and, main, and remain in existence than that for the sake of preserving this fiction that there is such a thing called the public trust, trust doctrine surrounding artwork, it should, it should fold and, and put its artwork elsewhere. So on, on the merits, I think that that's a problem. In addition, and perhaps a bit more cynically, um, I think there's kind of a quasi-public uh, public choice economics or quasi-antitrust <coughs> concern in relationship to this issue as well, in the sense that if museums, which hold vast quantities of artwork, are not permitted to monetize any of that artwork ever for the purpose of anything other than plowing it back into more artwork on the open market, what does that do? Right? It creates scarcity in artwork. Right? So it makes the price of artwork go up because there's less of it available for people to purchase at auction or, or privately. Right? Who benefits from that increase in price? Well, the people who own artwork privately. Right? So I think there are also broader structural reasons to be concerned about the impact uh, st structurally 
on the art market, and also the way it, it, the, the application of the public trust doctrine might steer um, the, uh, any increase in capital value of the artwork to private individuals. So let's look at there. I'm really interested to hear uh, all your thoughts on this, and if I'm missing anything or under misunderstanding anything, um, you're both experts in more, way than one, than, in, more, in, more, in more ways than one than I am well, on the subject matter in question. So, Judge Rosen, I'm watching you in response to many things that Professor Fry has said. Um, would either of you uh, like to specifically respond? To, and, and if I could just interject one. Oh. I realize I'm not on. Um, sorry about that. I'm saying that um, Judge Rosen will respond, but I, I just want to give one, if I could, some one overriding thought, which is um, one of the purposes of bankruptcy, particularly in a Chapter 9, is to try to get to a resolution. So often we'll find in a complex bankruptcy setting, a Chapter 11 or, or in Chapter 9s, and if you look at a number of Chapter 9s that have occurred around the country, some have taken years, and I think Stockton maybe just concluded, um, in years. And so, so there are competing interests, and clearly Professor Fry has put at issue the competing interest of um, having a city move forward and whether or not um, there is essentially a concept of a cultural bankruptcy uh, versus the competing interest of creditors versus the competing notion of what happens to art um, in, in the marketplace. So, Judge Rosen, if you would like to respond to any of those thoughts or anything that Professor Fry has said. The question of the valuation of the art was one of the great questions in the bankruptcy. Kevin Orr, uh, the emergency manager, retained Christie's to do a, uh, an appraisal of the value. And for reasons I was never privy to, and maybe Jean knows, uh, Christie's decided to value only what they called the tier one art, which was the art that was unquestionably owned uh, outright by the city, subject to no restrictions, other than the public trust argument, uh, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, that was about 2,612 pieces, I believe. But they were the most valuable 2,612 pieces by far. The estimates were that those 2,612 pieces of the 66,000 pieces uh, were uh, com comprised 75 to 80 percent of the total value of the art. So, and that's where that's where there was a lot of, shall we say, discussion. One of the creditors, uh, our bitter ender creditor, Fidget. Uh, did their own sort of what I characterized as a down and dirty appraisal, uh, which said the value of the collection was eight and a half billion dollars. Um, I don't know how much they attributed it to the shards of pottery and the pieces of tapestry and everything else that's in the basement, or Howdy Doody for that matter, that's, who's also in the basement. But um, invaluable, invaluable, right? Um, <laughs> you know that was a big discussion throughout. Christie's appraisal came back at a range of 452 million to 876 million. I might have those numbers a little bit off. Um, but there were many caveats and disclaimers about that valuation, not the least of which was if this was a fire sale, uh, the valuation could be much, much lower. And there were, for many of these pieces, just a few potential buyers in the world, oligarchs in Russia, Shakes in Dubai, uh, which I found just appalling to even consider that our cultural heritage would be sitting on walls uh, of sheikhs in Dubai and oligarchs in Russia. But I did want to come back to something the professor said. Uh, I personally, as I shared with Gene at several of our meetings and as lawyers, uh, did not put much stock in the Attorney General's advisory opinion of the public trust for reasons that the professor has said. Um, first of all, we could not find an opinion that dealt with museums. All of the public trust theories that we saw dealt were in the environmental context and dealt with such things as parks, national forests, state parks, and those sorts of things. 
beaches, yes. So it didn't seem to me to be a, an analogy that was comfortably and easily made. Uh, secondly, uh, this was a bankruptcy. And, uh, you know, in terms of the impairment of the restrictions, I thought that was a very close, for the art that was restricted, uh, I thought that was a very close question. But, I mean, let's face it, uh, what is bankruptcy about? It's about the impairment of contracts and agreements. Uh, that's what happens every day in the bankruptcy court. Contracts and agreements are impaired, and this was the subject of a couple of our full, frank, and candid discussions that we had at the beginning. So the question of whether the, the collection was at risk was, I think, a very open question just on the legal issues. I, I did disagree somewhat with a couple of the things the professor said, and I just want to sort of spell that out. Uh, first of all, uh, on the issue of valuation, uh, the city didn't get $400 million for the art. It got $820 million over a 20-year runway. Now, if you present value that, uh, we actually used, for purposes of present valuing, a formula that the governor himself did, who was an accountant. Um, and the present value of the uh, art would have, of the $820 million, on a 20-year runway, present value back, was something like uh, 500 and something million. So it was actually more, okay. if, pres if you're present valuing it. So it, I thought that it was comfortably within the valuation of the <coughs> year one art. Um, secondly, uh, your characterization, Professor, of Judge Rhodes's opinion that the city could not sell the art, I don't, perhaps you missed a little bit of the nuance. Uh, and Judge Rhodes and I discussed this during the bankruptcy and then many times after. The city owned the art. And other than the public trust theory, which I think you and I agree is challenging, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Orr could have sold the art. What Judge Rhodes did say, and which I agreed with, was that the creditors could not force the sale of the art. That's a very different, a very different uh, thing. And that discussion, particularly as we got down to the end with Fidget, who was taking the lead on forcing the sale, uh, that was the subject of, uh, shall we say, robust discussion. Um, and Judge Rhodes felt very strongly, and I agreed with him, that number one, these creditors, when they did their, when they did their financing, uh, particularly Sincor, the banks uh, that Sincor and Fidget insured because those two were the insurers of that debt. Um, never relied on the art. Never relied. There was not a single document that reflected in any way that they relied for satisfaction of that debt on the art. And I think Judge Rhodes' uh, opinion is that the creditors had no substantial interest itself, themselves, in being able to force a sale of the art. And that was a critical distinction. Whether Kevin Orr could have sold it is a very different question. And Judge Rhodes and I, frankly, have had a lot of discussions about that. But I think he, he, would, he would agree that if Kevin Orr had decided to sell the art as the emergency manager, he could have sold the art. Uh, you know, there would have been this issue of the public trust that the Attorney General identified. And uh, my entire objective in figuring out how to monetize the art without selling it was to save the art for many reasons. And I'll just talk about a few of them because they're not legal reasons particularly. They're human reasons and they go to who we are in this community. One of the first things I noticed when I was, actually, Gene, I, I drew my little doodle. I was uh, I'm supposedly on a golfing vacation about two weeks after I was appointed as a mediator. And to me, there were two <coughs> bookends to the grand bargain, uh, to, to the bankruptcy, rather. On the one bookend was the DIA and the art and all that it meant to the city and its people, but more than that. And on the other end of the bookend was the retirees and the human element. And, the human needs, and also the very real legal issues 
which would have gone for sure up to the Supreme Court, at least on the collision between the state constitutional, state constitution's pension provision and, uh, and the bankruptcy supremacy, the supremacy clause of the federal constitution. Uh, so when I began thinking about this, and thinking about it in terms of bookends, which is really what my little doodle is, uh, I began thinking, not only are these legal issues, both of which could go to this, were cert worthy, go to the Supreme Court, but taking just the DIA for a moment, uh, the DIA is more than an art museum, folks. Uh, at, at so many levels, it's who we are in this community, it's our cultural heritage. And I thought, here we go again, cannibalizing our heritage to mortgage our future. It's what Detroit has been doing for decades. And I, and I told the governor this, I, I said, if we sell the art, we will be weighed by history in the balance of found quantity. And beyond that, the DIA really anchors Midtown. At the time, I went on the website, and uh, the DIA draws 600,000 people, probably more now, mm -hmm. but at the time, about 600,000 people to Midtown. Midtown was one of the areas of Detroit that was nascently growing, one of the few areas that was nascently growing. If we liquidated the DIA, it would have been like dropping a hydrogen bomb in the middle of Midtown. It would have sucked the life out of that area. And beyond that, I, I realized there were demographic and cultural and geopolitical issues. As Jean talked about, the surrounding communities had just pledged their support of the DIA through a village. And the DIA's board consisted of many community leaders in this community. On the other hand, we had very real human needs reflected in the retirees, the pensioners. Their pensions were not lavish. Contrary to some early reports, the average civilian pension was $19,000. The average uniform pension, and by the way, these weren't just retired police officers and firefighters. There were widows, survivors, families of people who had been killed in action. The, their average pension was $32,000 and they didn't get Social Security. So it would have settled off, selling the DIA would have. I believe, instigated almost a civil war in this region. And it would have been an ugly civil war. There would have been racial issues to it because many of the retirees, the vast majority of the retirees, were black. And they were saying, I will never forget when the leader of the uh, civilian retiree, Shirley Lightsey, got up in the first meeting we had, the first mediation, and she said, she said, Judge, I love the DIA. This is an elegant, elegant 80-year-old woman. And she said, I love the DIA. I take my grandchildren to the DIA. But if it's a choice between some paintings hanging on a wall and feeding my family, that's not a hard choice. And boy, that was just, you know. <laughs> you know, so liquidating the DIA, and, and the DIA quite rightly viewed themselves as stewards of this incredible cultural heritage that we've been given. And to sell the DIA would have, you know, it would, we would have been cannibalizing our heritage, but it would also have set off a war. The folks at the DIA, when, when we found the case, were doing what they should have been doing, which was preparing for litigation. They were, they were assembling a litigation fund, and they were not going to just roll over and say, okay, which paintings do you want to sell? And that would have ignited a cultural civil war in our community. It, it was unimaginable to me that we could do that. So that was my job. My job was to find a way to finesse that. And uh, that's how, you know, that's how the grand bargain, I didn't name it that, by the way. <laughs> the Detroit Free Press did. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, John Gallagher, who was a reporter, called me. He was trying, when the story broke, I tried desperately to keep it quiet. 
confidential, but you know. And it lasted eight days. <laughs> Which my good friend and which my good friend and neighbor John Woolman, the publisher of the news, uh -huh. uh, when I called him and pleaded with him not to publish the story about what became known as the Grand Bargain, he said it's amazing that it lasted eight days. <laughs> but at any rate, John Gallagher, the Free Press reporter who was then chasing the story, called me and as I explained the mechanics of how it worked, um, uh, he said, "Oh, well." You know, that's sort of like a, a grand bargain then. I mean, it was just a very offhanded comment. And I thought, I, the first thing that came to my mind was the grand bargain that had supposedly been agreed upon between President Obama and Speaker Boehner on the budget the year before, which had fallen apart in recrimination and finger pointing. <laughs> and I said, and I said, well, I hope ours fare is a little better than that, than the last grand bargain. And he said, well, I think you got a shot. I attributed it no significance at all to it until two days later, it was the lead sentence uh, in the story that John and his writing partner, Mark Stryker, wrote. So that's how we got to the grand bargain. I want to tell one last story then. I'm, and then, if yeah. I, we want to leave at least a couple minutes for okay. Q&A. So Gene is being very modest, as always, about how the DIA uh, came to the table. And here's how it happened. The governor was going to Washington uh, at the end of January to receive an award uh, for being the governor most supportive of the arts uh, from an uh, a or association called the Americans for Art. And he had invited Gene to go with him and participate, I believe, participate mm -hmm. in the award. So the governor had been pushing me and Eugene Dreiker to push Gene Gargaro to come up with more money than uh, we had managed to uh, get the DIA to come up with. And uh, I had reported to him the state status of our negotiations, and he said, well, you know, I don't know. He said, uh, let me work on this. <laughs> So uh, he called me the night before the trip to Washington, and uh, I was sitting there coincidentally watching my favorite show, The Big Bang Theory, for those of you who might be Big Bang <laughs> nerds. Um, and he said, guess what I've been doing for the last hour? I said, what's that? He says, I've got, you remember, he's a CPA. He says, I've got the DIA's audited financials. He said, I think I can see how we can save them four or five million dollars a year. Really, and then he sort of dove into this accountant speak, and a fog descended. <laughs> uh, and I said, all right, "I said, all right, Rick, what are you going to do with that?" He said, "I'm going to ask Gene for a hundred million dollars tomorrow." I said, "Rick, get the award first. <laughs> uh, and he he called me the next day, uh, and he said, uh, "He said I've got some good news. I had a very productive breakfast with Gene." I said, great. I said, how productive? He said, yep, I got you $100 million. I said, really? Said, yeah, so I didn't, Gene called me, I think, the next day, and I didn't tell him what the governor had said, and I said, you know, how did things go with the governor in Washington? He said it was the most expensive breakfast in history. <laughs> That's right. I'm just going to add a footnote, and thought your comments were very, very well done. Uh, as the judge noted, uh, we were prepared at the museum to litigate this case, whatever it took. And although we have some marvelous bankruptcy lawyers in our community, we had hired the Cravath firm from New York. They were ready, and in uh, October of 2013, on a Friday afternoon, I got a call. And it was the lead partner in the bankruptcy team saying, Gene, we have to file this lawsuit today or we're going to miss the chance to really get into the game and we need to be represented. And I said to him, um, I, I know what you're saying. If we file a lawsuit, we're going to have a whole different conversation than we could, not knowing that I would get a call from Judge Rosen a few weeks later. But I said, we're going to be having a whole different conversation. Let's hold on filing that suit. Very disappointed, the whole group, but as I say, three weeks later, I get invited to uh, Judge Rosen's courtroom and begin a conversation that would have been far different if we had been in, uh, in litigation. That could have taken a long time. The city didn't have that time. 
Uh, we didn't want to do that, but we were prepared to do that. One other comment, and then I'll open it to questions, or you may. Uh, there were multiple parties in this matter that uh, weren't all reported about. I was regularly receiving phone calls from Brooks Patterson, <laughs> Oakland County Executive, from Mark Hackle, the, o the Macomb County Executive, and from the then Wayne County Executive, Bob Ficano, all saying to me in, in a very serious yet uh, meaningful way, you start selling art at the DIA, we're going to advise our citizens to stop paying the millage you just succeeded in, a, in, a, in acquiring. And if that started, and the, the rationale was there won't be the artworks at the museum that we're, we're paying our tax dollars for. If that started, then literally it would have been a, a crescendo of sales, millage stopping $23 million a year we have a $30 million budget, the place would have closed in a matter of months. To so, say nothing of the political war that that would have started. Absolutely. So there were all sorts of compelling uh, pressures to uh, stay the course, try and find a way other than the sale of art, and uh, fortunately, uh, with, with gentlemen sitting to my left, uh, we, we made it happen. <laughs> So, are there any questions? <coughs> Nobody has any questions? Um, I have three questions. Yes. Thank you for speaking. It was uh, great, and we all appreciate it. Also, I'm not sure if you guys mentioned this. I think you touched on it for a second. There was a lot of outsourcing to bigger firms, Jones Day, and a firm you just mentioned. Why was that? I understand that. I think maybe Miller Canfield had their hands in this. Well, why did you guys do a lot of the uh, outsourcing to uh, New York and Washington? So, um, just to clarify, Jones Day was hired by the city, not. No, I. Okay. okay. I mean, if anybody can clarify, I just wonder. Maybe don't have the answer. Go ahead. That's your. Let's engage in reality here, rather than politics. This was the largest municipal bankruptcy in history. It was the most complex municipal bankruptcy in history. What we've talked about here for the last 45 minutes or so is not even the tip of the iceberg. There were maybe two or three firms in the entire country that could have handled this bankruptcy, that had the resources, the expertise, and the manpower to throw at this case. The notion that, and I, and I I'm a Miller Can former Miller Canfield lawyer. That a firm like Miller Canfield could have done this is a fantasy. And I love Miller Canfield. They are great lawyers. Uh, I love Honigman. I love Dickinson. I love Dykema. I love many of the firms here. And indeed, every one of those firms was involved in the bankruptcy in one way or another. Honigman represented the DIA. Dickinson represented the governor. Dykema was involved in the water and sewer deal. But there was not a single firm in this city, in, in this state, that could possibly have done this. Indeed, I'm not sure even in the entire country there was more than maybe two or three firms that could have handled this bankruptcy. And I am, I'm going to say this publicly, uh, because I dealt with these lawyers far more than anybody else did, including Judge Rhodes, who, who agrees with what I'm going to say. To see Jones Day attacked, after what they accomplished in this bankruptcy in record time is a travesty. It's wrong, and people who are doing this are playing politics with it. They have no idea what went on inside that case. These were some of the greatest professionals I've ever seen. And not just Jones Day, all of the lawyers, including the lawyers for the creditors, including the creditors who were, you know, sort of at the end fighting. These were the very best lawyers in the country, if not the world, and the very best financial experts, Ernst & Young, Conway McKenzie, um, the Houlihan firm that represented some of the creditors. The notion that the city was somehow raped by the professionals, and I'm going to be very blunt here, is a fairy tale, 
and it's just wrong. And to put this in context, let me just say this. Here's what we found on July 18. We found staggering debt, way beyond the $18 billion in the numbers. We found a dysfunctional city with no ability to monetize itself. We found a city that wasn't operating, period. And it pledged its most valuable assets in essentially a, um, a gamble. It was a bet. It, it, That's what we found. And if, any, and if somebody had said to anybody who was going to be running the city in the future, all right, here's the situation July 18 of 2013. $18 billion in debt, a dysfunctional city with no assets. And for $150 million, you can get out of it in 16 months, and your credit rating, your bond rating will be investment grade. You'll have uh, collective bargaining agreements with all of your unions, good collective bargaining agreements. Your pensioners will take almost no hit at all. You'll have a regional water authority, which for decades this city and the region have been fighting about. I could go on and on. You'll have $1.7 billion for revitalization and, uh, of the city, hiring police and firefighters, infrastructure. Is there anybody in this room that would say for $150 million in 16 months wouldn't raise their hand and say, where do I sign? So, you know, if I seem a little passionate about this, this Monday morning quarterback <laughs> that's going on, uh, and I have no stake in this. I was the middle guy. But I dealt with these people. I saw the personal stories behind the sacrifices that these professionals made, including Julie's firm and, and, and others. And I think to attack these people is beyond the, politics, the politics of it. I'm not a politician. I think it's I think it's just wrong. Just really quickly to that. You know, when I first looked at the docket for this case, I was very very dismayed, um, and uh, I read through huge amounts of material related just to the Dia settlement. And I gotta say, it was some of the best lawyering I've ever seen. So remarkable lawyering. Gene has a comment, and then we'll close. Just on another note, uh, before you arrived. One of our panelists in the previous segment mentioned a, uh, an incident in 1943 when Joseph Stalin toasted Detroit <laughs> when they were at, uh, met with Roosevelt and uh, Stalin and uh, Churchill. We can't get into the Churchill stories with this fellow who will be here till 3 o'clock. It was at Tehran. Yes. Uh, last March, I was in Amsterdam. The DIA, as you know, has marvelous artwork. We loan it around the world. So museums in Brussels and Amsterdam had borrowed art. I went over to thank the directors in those museums uh, for that reciprocal loaning we do. Before I could even introduce myself, the directors in these institutions said, what you did in Detroit, we collectively did in Detroit, uh, was an international success story. Not just for our wonderful city, but it set a template around the world that if we had sold art to pay municipal obligations, museums all over the world, many of whom had similar situations to ours, would have been impacted by that decision. So when you're in the bunker in Detroit fighting these battles and you're you're thinking in a smaller context. Uh, we got toasted wonderfully, and we're being toasted around the world for what Judge Rosen and Judge Rhodes and many others in that uh, historic story have accomplished for us. We all ought to be very proud of that. Thank you. It's hard to top that, and I don't want to be what my father used to accuse me of always needing the last word. But I think the takeaway from this is that we need collaboration, and we need cooperation. And this was the, the shining example of what those 
two attributes can do to bring together something really positive for our community and for the city, uh, the city and the region, because our city is part of a, a, a region. We're, we're not isolated in Detroit. And um, particularly um, Mr. Gargaro and Judge Rosen uh, deserve uh, a lot of credit. The professionals who worked on it deserve a lot of credit. And I thank you all, Professor Fry, thank you for your perspective, it really as an outsider, but I hope tomorrow you spend a really nice day at the DIA. And um, thank you. Yeah.